welcome everyone who's uh, joining us for um, our, our seminar today. Uh, and uh, really impressed with the, with the sign up. Uh, over 160 people, most of them learners, students, I guess we're all learners, but uh, it's fall and it's great to have our, our students engaged and, uh, and part of our center's conversation. Um, welcome uh, again to our uh, Center of Global Health Equity seminar series. Um, for some of you who are new to the center, we're not quite at our two-year mark. So this was a center that was launched in the, in the middle of the pandemic. And it's a center that spans the entire university, including all three of our campuses. And the focus is on how do we improve health in low income countries. Some middle income populations in middle income countries, but um, how can we focus on equity with particular attention to how do we collaborate? You know, often um, people from privileged countries run in, think they know what they're doing. Um, we need to be focused completely on listening and co-design because the people who are in these settings um, are very much in touch with the issues and the opportunities. The other major orientation of our center is we want to stay focused on impact. Uh, sometimes major research institutions um, focus exclusively on research, um, the next paper, the next grant, and academia is a world in itself. Sometimes we're not as good about talking about impact well, how are people going to be living better or longer because of this? So we want to change the language. Of course, we're academic, but we want to stay focused on relevance to um, the people that ultimately we're all called on to, to serve. So it's great uh, to have so many uh, people here. Please pay attention to our website. Uh, my name is Joe Kolars. I'm the, the director of the Center for Global Health Equity, and I have a fantastic team you'll be hearing about um, over these sessions. But let me introduce you to today's topic and today's speaker. One of the things that um, I think we all appreciate is seeing somebody that we want to be and then trying to figure out how did you get there? So um, for me, Patty Garcia is definitely one of those individuals. And she has agreed to come and explain her journey, how she got to be where she is now. And you'll be hearing other speakers throughout the year sharing their journeys. Um, why do I admire um, uh, Professor um, Garcia? Um, she's proudly Peruvian, coming from a continent and a country I spent time in and really admire but she brings experience from the field as a practitioner, as somebody who's developed expertise in infectious disease and then public health. Um, she brings experience from academia. She's been uh, a dean of the School of Public Health, one of the leading ones in South America. Um, she's gone into government um, as a minister of health to try and legislate and put policy into action. And she's just one of the most practical but also visionary individuals that um, I've had the chance to, to learn from uh, in my career. Um, normally, um, people who introduce like myself quickly run the CV and turn things people uh, over to the speaker. But in this case, the journey, the CV, and more importantly, the things not on the CV is the topic for today's discussion. So um, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Professor Garcia. Um, and she's going to be um, sharing some, some reflections and points along the way of her journey. Then we're gonna open it up to questions. So please put any questions you might have in the box and, uh, and then we'll be wrapping up right before the hour. So uh, Dr. Garcia, thanks so much uh, for being with us. Hello, Joe. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. It is really an honor and a pleasure. So um, I will share my screen and I hope that you can see it now. Yes. 
Excellent. Um, today, as you said, I would like to share um, with you my personal story, my path and my career in research in public and global health. So let's see if this works. There we go. This is me, born and raised in Lima, Peru, and since I remember eager to learn and improve things. But when I was around six years old, I was diagnosed with a lymphoma. I was very sick, but doctors were incredibly nice and made me feel better every time they talked to me. Eventually, it was shown it was not a lymphoma. It was an atypical presentation of a common infectious disease in Peru at that time, which is brucellosis. And with antibiotics and a lot of rest almost a year, I eventually got better and decided my path in life. I really wanted to be a doctor. So one of my role models was my grandmother. She was from the Andean region and a chamana, which is a traditional healer. I learned from her how to care for people, how to cure rubbing an egg to extract diseases or rubbing a guinea pig, which we call the cuy, or how to wash your sorrows and diseases with flowers or herbal medicine. But the most important thing that I learned from her was the importance to listen to people. I graduated from high school and singing was one of my passions. And then I was admitted to medical school in Peru. There were only eight women in my class of 60 people. And time passed and I graduated first of my class. And my thesis was about hematological abnormalities in patients with brucellosis. And there I found something that it was not commonly known that about 14% of people with brucellosis develop pancytopenia, bone marrow cytophagocytosis, and severe hepatosplenomegaly, exactly like me. Anyway, here you can see there is my mom, me, my father, my sister, and my boyfriend at that time. And since my father, who is in the center, was diagnosed with lung cancer, and he required a specialized treatment that he couldn't get in Peru, my professors at the university convinced me to apply to a residency in the U.S., which was never in my plans before. I took the tests. I passed, I interviewed, I negotiated help for my father. I got the position for an internal medicine residency in the US, but my father died before I started. But my path was marked. And then I met King Holmes at the University of Washington while doing my fellowship in infectious diseases. He became my mentor and he really showed me the light and started my passion for research and for public health. I learned from him that one good action in public health can change the life of hundreds of thousands of people. So I continued my training, got married, had my two children, and I cannot lie to you, especially if you are a woman trying to find a balance between your personal and your professional life, that's really a big challenge, but it's also very important. If you want to have a partner, chose wisely. My husband is also an epidemiologist, and through our life, we have taken turns to grow professionally, always supporting each other. Anyway, I tried to learn as much as I could while I was training in the U.S., and I continue working always with the idea of returning back to Peru and work in my own country, which I did. I got back to Peru and after almost a year, 11 years in the US with three grants written, luckily all funded. I worked for almost two years as the head of the comprehensive care of patients with HIV and STIs at the recently created National HIV STI program that was in around the nineties. And then I started as a faculty at the new School of Public Health at Cayetano Heredia University in Lima, Peru, which is a university that I work now. I work in research in sexually transmitted infections and HIV. I work with non-traditional providers like pharmacy workers, women from indigenous communities, HPV and vaccines, new technologies to improve public health, including new diagnostics. I work on implementation research. And in the meantime, while I was very busy working all those things, 
My children grew up and now they are both medical doctors. There is Marco and Paloma. And in 2006, I became head of the National Institute of Health, being the first and only woman in this position in its 110 years of existence. The Peruvian National Institute of Health carries out evaluations and research that provides scientific evidence for the control of main diseases that are prevalent in the country. And um, it also runs the National Microbiology Labs. During the time I was in charge, which was around three years, I was able to create the first national laboratory information system in the country called NetLab, establish the influenza and other respiratory viruses surveillance system for the very first time in the country, improve the diagnostic capabilities for MDR tuberculosis in the laboratory network, create a web-based system for the registration and monitoring of clinical trials in Peru, create a system to monitor nutritional status in mothers and children, strengthen collaborations with regional governments to improve laboratory capacities in the regions, implement a census of indigenous populations in Peru, and improve the capacity for local production of the rabies vaccine and a snake antivenom serum. Believe it or not, in Peru, snake bites are one of the most important causes of death in the Amazon area. So I did so many other things, but always thinking about actions that could have an impact on equity and inclusion. So time passed and back at the university at the School of Public Health, I continue working in research now with the experience on how to create bridges between the academia and the government and convince on the need to design, test and scale up innovative public health strategies to improve equity by mitigating the impact on disadvantaged populations. And around that time, and that's why I look very happy here, I was elected Dean of the School of Public Health. So I decided to start a multi-country study to introduce point of care rapid syphilis tests in public health centers for the control of maternal syphilis, aiming for elimination of congenital syphilis, which in Peru is 20 times more frequent than HIV infections. So we got funding from the Gates Foundation and later on from Grand Challenges Canada, and we started this study. And we were able to go from research to policy, and the study became a model to help other Latin American countries in the, on the implementation of rapid syphilis testing. The project was called CISNE, which is SWAN, because their women, when we were trying to understand what women knew about uh, syphilis, they, they didn't, know, didn't know anything about it, but they were thinking that if there is something that you can just treat with one shot or two or three of penicillin, it's like the ugly duckling becoming a, a swan. It's like saving your baby. So they call that beautiful name to this project. So following the technology and knowing that there was a new technology coming, which was the dual syphilis and HIV point of care test, we work on the implementation model for this dual test to improve the coverage of screening in antenatal care for both diseases, HIV and syphilis, and work with community health agents who can do the testing wherever it's needed. And now this is implemented in Peru nationally, and we're helping other countries in the implementation. The other thing that I started working in um, my country was medical informatics as a discipline and a practice with a formal program at the university, which became a model in Latin America. And so we started also doing research in different areas of medical informatics with our former trainees, like the development on um, evaluation of electronic medical records and other informatic tools for better public health. And I never planned it, but in July 2016, I was invited to be Minister of Health of Peru with the new government. And as you can see, I was really happy and it was a celebration for me. I felt I could do a lot for my country, but I knew that those were incredibly challenging moments with a huge political party opposition. At the end, I tripled the average time of Ministers of Health of Peru 
in these past six years, there have been more than a dozen. I have almost lost the count. And I stayed only a year and two months. But as a Minister of Health, I led and worked collaboratively with multidisciplinary teams to achieve many key changes in a relatively short period with a lot of political instability. These key changes include the introduction of emergency contraception for women in Peru and the contraception for adolescents through the public sector, greatly improving health equity. We also implemented new guidelines for cervical cancer, including molecular testing, expanded HPV vaccination, introduced new guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of hepatitis C, aiming for elimination, achieved the implementation of labels in processed food products towards prevention of non-communicable diseases, and introduced electronic medical records and telemedicine between other achievements. During that time, I also learned how to deal with the media, which is not always easy. Let me see if I can pass this. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, but it's quite important because you really need to give messages. Back at my academic life, I have continued working in teaching, mentoring, and doing research. And one of my main projects uh, is Project HOPE. HOPE is a social innovation project aiming to increase the access of HPV testing in Peru and promoting a culture of cervical cancer prevention. And actually, this project is based on four pillars. The use of molecular HPV tests for screening, the use of self-collected vaginal samples, which empowers women, reduces the stigma, and increases the screening coverage, community women teaching other women about cervical cancer and how to apply the HPV tests. And Actually, we were able to co-design with the women these bags that they could open and could show the women how they look from the inside and could show them how to do the self-sampling, which was very important because most of the women had interactions in the markets. We also include the use of technology with the development of an informatics platform for the follow-up and sending SMS, WhatsApp messages to positive women. So, in 2020, um, we won a social innovation award from for this HOPE model, which was aiming for sustainability by selling and delivering at home HPV self-tests to women who could afford them. So that's the retail component that you can see there and use the money to support the social component with the motto of buying one test, buy one test and save two lives. However, as everybody knows, we had to put on hold the study due to the pandemic. And as other researchers who were looking for ways to contribute in the fight against COVID. And I worked in global and local advisory committees, ran clinical trials in Peru, and also had to fight for policies based on evidence in my own country. And trying to inform the public, answering journalists, I ended up having a TV program daily from 3 to 4 p.m. and repeated at night from 10 to 11 p.m. during the worst period um, of the lockdown and for almost six months, bringing information to people regarding health in a simple way and bringing prevention messages. But finally, in 2022, we restarted Slowly Hope and in March, we started a new model working together with regional governments, trying to reach indigenous women's women from rural areas. Actually, we call it Hope Cajamarca. Cajamarca is a region in the Andes. They call it the Switzerland of Peru. And the idea was to introduce new technologies to catalyze health systems redesign, using self-sampling HPV molecular tests, but using also a pocket coposcope that um, Duke University had worked with, um, had developed, and promoting what we call tele-VIA or telecolposcopy, increasing accountability and having quality control. We didn't have experts in the Andean region when we had midwives using it and experts far away helping them making decisions for diagnosis and also introducing a thermocoagulator, assuring almost uh, also assuring adequate management at the first level and references to other facilities if needed. So the idea was to redesign health systems for better cervical cancer prevention and management, including equity and inclusion. And 
our goal with this study was to try to reach 4,000 women with HPV self-sampling at the level of the community. And for the women that were positive, try to bring all of them to the first level and try to manage at least 90% of them at the first level and create the capacities on the second and the third level to manage those women with more advanced diseases. So, so far, we are almost reaching the 3,000 women, 15% are positive, and 98% are showing up at the clinic appointment. 91% are managed at the primary care level, and about 8% required references are we're managing them. And at this point, we're providing evidence for the national guidelines and working with the Ministry of Health on how to scale up this model. So global health, Health issues in this 21st century are complex for the whole world globally. And finally, we're recognizing that we share vulnerabilities. Populations are growing and are getting older. That's what we call the demographic changes. And that is causing a shift in diseases with epidemiological transmission, transition, double burden, and pandemic threats that are now realities. Um, also, together with climate change, humanitarian crises, and civil conflicts, and the burden of mental disorders, which is huge, everything in an interconnected world with global travel and incredible fast information flow, which could be good, but can also spread myths, fears, and bad practices, as we have seen with the infodemia during the pandemic. And finally, causing social pressure and technological pressure and none of these things are making things easier for global health. So the challenge is really how to adapt health systems to promote prevention, and ensure access and care, and empower citizens and communities. And for that, we need to have investments in research and innovation, and we need to have new strategies in global public health. And those new strategies should include scientific excellence, collaboration and networking, technology, a artificial intelligence, new diagnostics, point of care testing, self-testing, patient-centered approaches, community engagement, social innovation, and community-based innovations, working into implementation research, because we need research into policy and practice, taking into account the equity, diversity, and inclusion, sharing solutions globally, because there has to be cross-learning, and don't forget in the Latin American region. So, and creating also new models in global public health education because it is time to create our legacy. Um, so through my life, I have been jumping between academia and governmental positions. And I want to be to make clear that I'm not a politician. I was offered the opportunity for, of those positions and I took them. And the experience has allowed me to understand the importance of creating bridges between both sectors and how critical it is to go from research into policy and action, since it is the only way to truly contribute to improve health outcomes. But also it has allowed me to understand the challenges of creating the bridges and how effectively address them. I have also had the opportunity of sitting in global advisory boards like boards from PAHO and WHO and others. And this has given me the opportunity of contributing to promote policies at the global level too. And at this point, I would like to share with you my top 10 strategies to go on how to go from research to policy. So let's see if my slide works. There we go. So number one, it is critical to engage stakeholders as peers from the beginning and during all the study phases, because that's the only way that we can assure ownership of the agenda. Having a study and just bringing the results is not enough. It will never work. You have to learn about dissipating tensions between the stakeholders. And for that, it's important to spend time to meet, discuss, but also is critical to identify champions. Um, as academicians, we need to do what we know how to do. And training is, is a key part of what we do, but we have to train according to the needs and guided by a baseline and follow-up information of what is needed. We have to provide monitoring support and recognition. And recognition is not based on money. 
one thing that I learned, for example, is that people love to have certificates, okay? And it's so easy to have paper at different colors. And the same way that people have credit cards, like the silver, the gold, and the platinum, um, we learned that giving recognitions on people that are working and trying to do their best on different colors of paper, like the silver, the copper, the silver, the gold or the platinum will make a big difference and they feel proud because they're recognized. And that is something that we always don't think about in when we work in these issues that have to do with public global health. We have to share results and discuss actions together. We have to consult and get feedback from the users. We have to use simple but compelling messages it is quite important to involve other partners, NGOs, agencies, and of course, community. And we have to use friendly cost effectiveness analysis because usually the ones who will make the biggest decision of changing something are at the end those that have the money, like the Ministry of Finance. And they need to know about what is the cost effectiveness or the cost benefit that you are proposing to them. That's a type of language that they understand. And the last but not the least, least important, you have to keep yourself and others' motivation high because changes take time. So it is so great to have the possibility of working in global health because you can really help and you learn every day. And so let me tell you what I think that I have learned in my career in global public health. Number one is that training matters. If you're well prepared, opportunities will appear. Don't look for positions. Um, so don't spend your time making life plans. I never plan to be the dean of the school. I never plan to work at the National Institute of Health. I never plan to be Minister of Health. But develop a life philosophy. And my philosophy, and it has always been, is how can I help to make things better? So don't look for positions. Develop a life philosophy and also take the opportunities that will arise. Don't see problems, see opportunities to improve and transform things. Seeking out a more balanced life is not a women's issue only. Balance will be better for all of us. Number five, mentors. Mentors are critical as well as collaborators because they are for today and forever. You can do more when you work with a team. So if somebody tells you that they are doing things alone, that's not true. You need also to work on creating critical masses that can follow and can do other things that you might not be able to do. Keep records, especially from those lessons learned, from the good things that you do and the bad things that you do. All of them will really teach you something. It is important to negotiate respectfully and research has to be based on the needs of the communities we serve. And policies and interventions have to be based on evidence. And finally, nothing is impossible. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you will land among the stars. So public and global health are my passion. And I truly believe on using research as a way to fight inequities and promote inclusion. And I also believe in creating enabling environments with scientific excellence to inspire more people to work in global public health. And I'm very thankful that Joe gave me this opportunity to tell you a little bit about me, about what I did and about what I have learned. And don't forget that the ones who are crazy enough to think are the ones that can change the world. They are the ones that do it. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Garcia. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, inspiring, such an impactful career, but, um, but channeling us to look forward and to say, how can we make those types of things happen with our, with our careers? So, uh, so thank you. And I would um, uh, like to see uh, people uh, propose questions in the question and answer box. There's so much that we, we heard from Dr. Garcia. Um, um, maybe I'll start off with a, a, a question, Patty. 
Um, one of the things that um, is uh, topical right now in the global health arena is the term global health. Where did this term come from? It seems like a lot of people developed it in privileged countries or uh, places where our armies needed to, to, to have their vaccines before they were going to work on the Panama Canal and in other places. But it was often um, to try and help the colonizers. And uh, a lot of us in privileged countries talk about global health. What is the language of Peru? I mean, do people say we do global health here? Um, is that a common term that's used? Um, you know, when I look around parts of Africa and other parts of the world, people say, no, this is our health. These are our diseases. Maybe you'll call that global health, but we don't think of global health as an entity. Um, could you comment on that, please? Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, it's this is a historical thing, right? So countries in the North were trying to understand what was going in the South to be prepared for invasions of wars or trying to extract things, right? We were colonies, et cetera. So initially they were calling them these tropical diseases, right? Uh, or tropical health also. Um, then it was changed to the vision of the countries to other countries, international health, and actually the term evolved into global health, trying to give the idea that um, we were all sharing vulnerabilities and that there were no boundaries from the point of view of geographic boundaries or discipline boundaries, which it's, it's really, I mean, when, when you think about that definition, so sharing vulnerabilities, and maybe because we share vulnerabilities, we can also share solutions, right? Between all of them. I mean, I think the term is, it's, it's good. The problem is that one thing is how the term was defined and the other one is how global health has been seen. And actually probably Joe, you have heard me that everybody was talking about global health of what was going on southern to them. But if I do global health, do I need to look for a country that is really southern to me? That doesn't make any sense, okay? So I, I think about global, global health. So the kind of diseases that we have, that's what I have been using the term also public global health, okay? So for me, global health is exactly what the definition says. I mean, there might be cross learning between countries, uh, solutions that we may have that can help others. I mean, I, I think it's incredible, for example, that in the US, you are having an epidemic, a new epidemic of syphilis, and you are not able to use point of care tests that with one stick in your finger in 15 minutes, you can have a result that can allow you to take an action, identify people who are positive for syphilis, take an action and start treating them, right? While in our countries, we are doing it. So I guess when you ask me if we use the term, yes, in Peru, we're using the term global health, but we're using it with the connotation of we share vulnerabilities. And this is what the pandemic has shown us and other diseases has shown us too, okay? There shouldn't be boundaries, geographic boundaries. There shouldn't be discipline boundaries. And we need to think of the world as one. Unfortunately, we're still seeing this idea of the North and the South. Even the use of the term global North and global South for me is an absurd. Thank you. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of language, um, you know, to think about uh, income countries, privileged countries. Um, I think a lot of the low income countries have resources and riches I wish we had. Um, and uh, so I think there's a lot of 
problematic um, language that's out there, but I, I really like your, 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 your answer and your reflection there, Patty. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions from some of our students, some of our faculty. You know, you've often been doing your work from a perch either at a um, academic institution or an institute or government. Um, could you comment on what are, what are the, 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 the successes you've had in terms of staying engaged with partners at other institutions? You know, often we compete with each other. Um, and often um, people want to brand their own institute or their own work. But are there things that you found that are sustainable, authentic ways for you to collaborate and partner across those institutional boundaries that sometimes keep us separate? Yeah, well, those they're, the reality is that those exist, okay? They are, they are real. But one of the things that um, create, I, I think create real and sustained collaborations are also something that we can all do through our programs, which is training students and, and create legacies. Like I, I have to tell you, for example, that I'm so proud now because several of the people from other countries that came to train here for a year because of Fogarty or other funding now are professors at universities associate professors or professors at universities. And because we know each other for a long, long time, we have created these this, um, links and we're working together again. So I think that part of the negotiation is that um, you have to be very open of what everybody wants. So sit down on a table and say like, what would you like? What do you want? And be clear because in, in, in a relationship, Okay, everybody has to be clear on what they want to get, get from it. But for me, at least, uh, most of these um, relationships with institutions have been based of, on identifying a partner that is open, that is honest, that um, wants to really do things the right way. And I guess whenever I have found somebody that doesn't fit into that category, I rather don't work with them. And so um, I think it's good also, I mean, the same way that when you are going to have a personal partner, right? You need to think what they want, what you want, and if that doesn't match, it's better not to create those relations and, um, yeah, and, and, and if for me, I think it's critical also to try to nurture people since they start from the beginning. And I think those links also will last and respect is another thing that is um, quite important. Very nice. I think I have been lucky because I, I can think about maybe two opportunities in which I had to say, no, thank you because I realized that that was not the type of partnership because partnership is a big word, okay? And, um, and unless um, people understand what partnership or, or we have the same definition of partnership, um, I don't think it's worth to work together. Very nice. I'd like to pick up on that partnership theme. Um, in response to a question from one of our, our, our family medicine uh, uh, colleagues, um, how are you partnering with the, the communities in Peru to try and get self-sampling for HPV? Um, um, an observation is offered that often um, women or people in smaller communities are, can be um, uh, more cautious, feel more vulnerable, suddenly when academia is coming in or projects with new experiments. So how, how did that work for you in Peru, trying to get the, the communities to say, yeah, we'll partner with you on this, we'll engage. Any, any thoughts on that, Daddy? Well, first of all, there are always champions everywhere. So 
and, and women are usually champions in their communities, okay? But you need to find them. So let me tell you how we did it, okay? First of all, we this, these are communities that are not organized, okay? So it's not like I can find a, a community NGO or a, a group that we could identify. So it was kind of like new for us how to work with them. But what we decided is to start talking with people first at the health center, women that were sitting there. So, I mean, what do you think about, so this, this part of, of exploring how the community, the dynamics of the community, where do women go, et cetera, and what do women think was a very important thing. So listening and exploring was first. We realized from talking with the women at the health center, yeah, that one place where women go is to the health center, but you can find them also in the markets. So, and, and actually women told us, why don't you ask women that would like to help or work with you on these issues that had to do with health? And so what we started to do is we started to leave these little papers with the sleeps with our number. It's like, would you like to learn more about health issues? Would you like to be informed? Would you like to help your community about this? And actually we start receiving lots of phone calls of women, okay? And this was initially, it was completely free. We never paid the women at the very beginning. Then in, in the second phase of social innovation, now every woman that is able to, to give a, an HPV test for cell sampling to another woman, she receives a percent of, of uh, the, the, the test, right? Of, of the cost of the test. Anyway, so we realized that women were, they were willing to do something and they were also eager to learn. So that's the other thing. It's not only what you get from the community, but what you can give the community. And again, if, if you match those two things, women wanted to learn more about how to care for themselves and about cervical cancer and how can they help their communities. It was so interesting also to understand that in, in several of these communities, women get, get married very early in life. Um, kids live early also. And when they are around 35 to 40 years old, they feel that they have done all what they could do in their lives. So we were giving them another meaning, which was to help the communities. And actually, um, we have written also an, an article about empowerment. This participation, but participation that gives them something also gives them empowerment. So I guess I, what I'm saying is like, first of all, you need to understand the community understand what are the values, where do they go, what do they feel, and within that community, try to find champions that will allow you to connect with other people. And that's what we have done, and that's how I think this whole thing has worked. It depends, when we started working in the Andean region, the ideas were a little bit different, okay? And we have to start dealing, I mean, Yes, there was a little bit of, of distrust, but we have to work together with the women to understand how to really involve them. And actually, especially women, but also men in, in, in the communities, they want their community to be stronger and healthier. So if you offer them not only to work, but to be part of the solution and listen to their ideas. I mean, the fact that, for example, we created these bags with the women, okay? I think these, these bags were really critical and they use it and they still use it and can help them in the market, but can help them also to create these links with other women. So making them, engaging them, and as you, you were using the word co-creating, together with them will change these, these uh, differences and imbalances that usually appear. So we have to change the, the idea that the academia is here and the community is here. So we need to create that balance. And for that, we need to listen and work together and understand what they want and try to help them the same way that they will help us. Excellent. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, 
uh, a Dr. Diane Harper here at the University of Michigan, who is a real leader in um, HPV research. And she both wants to thank you for all of your efforts on, um, on cervical cancer prevention, but also um, uh, wants to know, um, there seems to be certain maybe phases of engagement with the community. It's one thing to do a vaccine or maybe do some testing, but then the whole culture of follow-up or for the people that need to be treated um, seems to be at least here where um, we, we, we really struggle. Um, after we find um, abnormal things, a lot of times people are lost to follow up. And uh, it's one thing to identify uh, somebody in need, it's another thing to make it happen. Um, have you been able to, to, to make progress in that gap in Peru? Yeah, so, and well, not in Peru, but at least that it, those are the kind of things that we're trying to study in this redesign of the health systems, okay? So one of the things is that most of our, that our health systems in general here and in the US are not really centered on the person, are centered on the administrative things, okay? And so that's a big, one of the biggest issues. So one of the things that we are trying to do is we're trying to close in that gap by involving the community in the screening. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we are realizing is that um, having a patient, I would call it patient advocator, which is a link between the system and the person. And in our case, at this point, we are working with community women and with professional midwives that could speak the same language and understand on one hand the health system, but understand also the barriers and the problems that women may have, okay? So we can adjust and assure that the woman doesn't lose follow-up and that she understands the issues regarding their disease and that the fear is not bigger because that's another thing. So once you use the word cancer, people think that they are going to die and they rather spend their time with the family, et cetera, when there are options and cancer is not something that has to kill them. So a patient advocate or so moving everything closer to women in the community. So that's one thing. The second thing, having a patient advocate that can be the link, that missing link between the health system and the patient speaking the same language and trying to make things easier for them. And the other one, which we have seen, and, and we are trying to calculate that too, we need to give some flexibility. Our system is very rigid. So you give one, one appointment and then people may never come, right? And nobody's really paying attention about, especially with women, what does it mean to be a woman that is sick? Women usually is the one that is caring for the house, the kids, and all the other people. And health is the last thing in their list, unfortunately. So what we are seeing as, as part of we're trying to collect all that information is women with the patient advocate don't feel ashamed to say like, you know, I need to take my kids to the school. So I cannot go at that time. So what will be the best time for you to, to, to come? So they suggest the time, and so we can adjust and we can serve them better. So centering the whole thing around the women, the same language, moving it into the community, I think those are very critical things. And technology can allow you to do that. So I wish, and this is something that we're working on, we could have something that could allow to have, the women could take their own picture of their cervix that can be sent to the doctor once they are positive, and only if there are issues there, you, I mean, she will need to go to the doctor, or maybe the doctor will send somebody to see her. That will be the ideal. The last thing that we are also um, trying to do is we need to really speak in the same language and inform better the women. So most of these women had never seen 
or never know how their cervix is. So we are kind of like studying what do they think? And if, for example, showing how their cervix is and how it, it becomes after the treatment can be also another way of motivating them to take care of their health and women talking with other women about their experiences. So I didn't die. They treat me and now my cervix looks like this. How can that be another way of changing things? So I think you're absolutely right. Our systems, so that's what we're talking about redesign, are not made for people. Okay, we need to change that. But in order to do that, we need to hear their voice too. So those are the kind of things that we're trying to understand and trying to to see it doesn't need to be more expensive. I think more expensive is to have the people evolving into very severe cancers because the treatment will be more expensive and eventually people will die too. Well, I, um, I, 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 I so appreciate that answer. One of the things I've translated in my mind a lot of times we take these engagements as transactional one-offs. We're trying to, to do a vaccination or do a test. But what I hear you doing is trying to engage the, the, the community, the women into a movement where you're trying to show value to them, education, and it's a process. It's not just a, a, a one-off. And uh, so that's uh, very admirable. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the questions and I'm gonna try and maybe mold them into one more um, a question for you, Patty, before I turn things uh, over to Amy. Um, boy, I've always been so inspired by your passion. And I, every time I see you speak, no matter what the topic is, it's the passion. And I loved your framing and advice to our students about, you know, get a life philosophy, get a passion. My question is, what advice do you have for people on how do they do that? So the students who are going, yeah, that makes sense. Follow your passion. I got to get a passion. Now, how do I do that? How do I end up feeling so energized like I see in Dr. Garcia? Do you have any advice for our students and others about how they, how they develop that aspect of themselves? I guess that's something that they have, people had to find inside themselves. I mean, what really, and, and that's, that's one of the advice that I give to people about choosing their career, okay? So I guess if whoever is listening to us, if they have chose their own career, think about why you did it. I mean, you did it because you want to make the world better, uh, try to find out why you think that you choose your career. I hope it's not because you want to make money because in global health, you're not going to make money, okay? Um, usually when I ask these people, will say, because I want to help people. So think about, I mean, think about that. If you really want to help people, how can you do it better? And that will energize you because you will be fulfilling something that you want. So I guess it's something that is inside. It might be sleeping there, but I think everybody should try to ask themselves, why did I choose to do what I'm doing? What would, I, what would make me really happy, okay? And if you do what, you are make, what makes you happy, you're gonna get the passion there. So I really enjoy what I do. And so the passion comes naturally, that's it. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's a great answer. I'd also add, I think often as a student or a learner, you overlook the fact that a lot of us are doing what we do because we are turned on by somebody else. That all of a sudden we started spending time with a mentor and suddenly it wasn't necessarily that particular field or problem. It was the nature of that relationship with a mentor. So the more that you can try and ask questions of the people that you see doing and, and just the kind of question that, that Dr. Garcia was answering today, how did I get to where I am right now? I'm passionate and full of energy, but what were the, the milestones? And um, I think if students, if you, you did more of that with asking and exposing yourself to people who look um, 
intriguing from a distance to say, how'd you get here? You know, most of us didn't roll out of bed one day and say, we're going to do this, but it was a revealing, a blooming of what's inside of you that suddenly comes to the forefront. So, um, so I Joe, and, and if you allowed me, because I saw that there please. were three questions that were kind of interesting. Thank you so much please, um, please. If, for those, right? So one was, they were asking me, what do I do when I'm a little down or when I'm slow in my work, et cetera, right? Please. So, um, yeah, of course, like everybody, I, I may have like my ups and downs. So I think in, in my case, when I have been down, down, actually my family has been a very good support. And my daughter, for example, once she started posting me some, um, some um, energetic thoughts about changing the world and doing this and doing that. So it was so interesting to have the, the, the family support in one sense. The other thing is um, I tried, and I told you that, I tried to keep notes on the things that I learned, the good ones and the bad ones. And that helped me to turn bad times into good times. But, um, and the third thing is um, looking at those that I have trained and the kind of things that they are doing also makes me think that we're in the right path. So I need to, to be happy and keep pushing. So you need to be, I'm an optimistic, but I think you can make yourself an optimistic if you try to see instead of the half glass empty, try to see it as the half glass full. So that was one of the things that I will recommend you because there are so many things that we can do really and you can make a difference. Um, there was another question regarding who pays the patient advocates in my project, okay? So right now, this is part of the project, but one of the things that I also mentioned is that it's quite important to do cost of, simple cost effectiveness analysis. And that's what we are working on, okay? As I said, what we are trying to see, I mean, it's much more expensive to have people dying, being more a advancing the disease, etc. But it's not enough to say it. I need to show it in numbers. We are in the process of collecting the, the numbers and all that information. And the third thing, there was a student that was asking how they could get opportunities to work in projects, etc. that we are doing here. And by the way, I agree with you, Joe, several times people start working on the topics that their mentor is working on, the opportunities that you have, or you have to be opportunistic to get, in, to get funds, okay? That's okay, because with that, you can get experience and you can learn, but eventually try to find which area brings you more passion, okay? And and you will find the opportunities. I mean, the opportunities are there. So if you would like to work in Peru, the Fogarty, Fogarty offers several scholarships for global, they call it global health, okay? For the opportunities of working, and not only with me, with other colleagues here at the School of Public Health at Cayetano in different type of projects. And there are different universities, um, that have that type of a uh, partnership with us. And so you just need to look for those opportunities. So those are the global health fellowships that are, I think there are like four or five different universities with whom we work and you can apply for them. I think that at this point it's, it is open. I don't know, Joe, I don't think we have one with you with Michigan, but, but students from different universities can apply to different ones. I think we have one with Harvard, one with UCSF, one with Yale. Um, I don't remember the other ones, but um, just look for the global health Fogarty opportunities. And they give you funding for a year and, um, and there are opportunities to work and create also links with, because we, we always try to twin you with students from Peru. So you can start creating your partnerships uh, for future research in our country with people around your age too. Thank you, Patty. And yes, you're right. We're part of the UW consortia. 
with Joe Zunt in the group. So we're we're part of that five school consortia for Fogarty. And I'm glad you mentioned that because it's a great way to put people in the field. I, I can't believe we're at time already. Um, uh, it's passed so quickly and we're just so grateful for um, you, you sharing your wisdom and your reflections and your points. So uh, the thing I re regret about Zoom is that uh, it's the, the loud clapping and standing ovation, which uh, clearly uh, Dr. Garcia deserves. But thank you. And we are going to have Dr. Garcia on campus. She's going to be um, critical to so many of the important things of our center. So thank you for your collaboration.